Okay, hey everybody. So I'm just gonna give like a pre-read uh, video. And so this is the section on completeness. And um, basically the idea is to do lots of things in calculus like integrals. Integrals are defined as limits of Riemann sums. Uh, so they're limits of a sequence. And the rational numbers are great because if I write down like four thirds, you know exactly what number that is, okay? You can store it in a computer. But if I write down the integral from 1 to 2 of blah, 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 this is some limit of a sequence, and it may not be a rational number. And so sort of we have to think about what, where, where does calculus make sense? And calculus makes sense in something we invent called the real numbers. Remember, this symbol was the natural numbers. That's maybe 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. forever. Sometimes people leave out 0. And then there's the rational numbers, which are the set of all fractions, such that a and b are integers. And we, ad we actually have to do something a little bit more. We have to glue things together. It's called an equivalence relation, but basically just like you consider, um, you don't want to consider three-fourths and six-eighths to be completely different numbers. You want to say that they're the same. And so you put an equivalence relation um, just by cross-multiplying. Um, eight times three and six times four are both 24. And so we sort of glue any, you know, A over B is glued to C over D whenever AD minus bc equals zero, okay. But anyway, the real numbers are what we get when we <coughs> invent numbers for every Cauchy sequence, Cauchy sequence of rational numbers. Okay, so if I give you a sequence of rational numbers, meaning like I give you a bunch of a sub n's um, where each a sub n is a rational number for every little n in the natural numbers. In other words, I give you a map into the rational numbers. And if that sequence is Cauchy, okay? And so right away, there's a word that you need to memorize, a word to simply memorize. A sequence of numbers is Cauchy if, and now precisely, for all positive real numbers, there exists an index. This is a natural number such that, <clears throat> you don't need to say it's positive, just say it's a natural number anyway, um, such that for anything past that index, in fact, any two indices past that index, they're within D of each other. They're within D of each other. So quiz yourself on this. Just do it like, just quiz yourself like maybe like five times in a row. Okay, a sequence is Cauchy if for all D there exists an N such that if I go past that N any pair of numbers is within D of each other. And I go and I fill in, um, this needs to be, this is still sort of a ball, like Z sub N and Z sub M are somewhere, and they're within a ball um, of each other. In other words, this distance here is that number. That distance has to be smaller than D, which means they're in a ball of size D. Okay. Um, this can be an index. And the difference here is we needed a pair because we don't have a limit. Like in the other one, remember in our previous thing, we had like some limiting value. This thing, this was the limit. But the point here is that in the rational numbers, there's not enough numbers. There are things like integrals 
the integral of something is equal to a limit of a certain Riemann sum sequence, and it's not. And sometimes it's not a, nat an, a rational number. So there is no rational number, which is the limit. And so we need to invent a new number, and, and we don't have w, okay? So we're going to invent a new number for every Cauchy sequence. Every Cauchy sequence will become a new number in our new number system called the real numbers. And remember, the complex numbers is... Oops, how do you do the complex numbers like that? The complex numbers is just twice the reals. And so the complex numbers are, are the reals, essentially. There's just a two-dimensional real space. And so, you know, everybody thinks like the big jump is from the real numbers up to the complex numbers, like, oh, very hard to go from here to here. No, in fact, the, the big jump is from the rational numbers and filling in all the gaps with the new numbers that we need, that we want, the numbers we want so that integrals make sense, the numbers we want so that um, we can sum infinite series. And um, this is the big jump. So anyway, you need to just know this word, Cauchy. Just quiz yourself again. A sequence is Cauchy if for all d there exists an n such that any pair past that n implies those pairs will be within d of each other. In other words, this sequence, all the numbers, any numbers, get really, really close together. They bunch up. They get close together. And, you know, any numbers past that point, so like uh, the entire infinite tail of the sequence just keeps getting closer and closer. For any desired distance, it gets that close. Okay, and so that's what the idea is. So you just need to memorize that. And then there's some proofs, like this proof. It's in your book. You can do it. Just read the proof in your book and then quiz yourself on it, quiz yourself on it, quiz yourself on it. Okay, so suppose that Zn is convergent. So you're assuming that the Zn converge. And you want to prove that, well, then the Zn are Cauchy. So that these are not new. Like, all of our convergent sequences were all, they were all, they were all Cauchy. Okay. And so it's, that's sort of showing that it's sort of an, it's a natural definition. Monotone convergence theorem, you need to prove it. Quiz yourself. Suppose that we have a monotone and bounded sequence in the real numbers. That's, that's key. The real numbers. Then that sequence converges. Basically, because by definition, the reals are such that every Cauchy sequence converges. And so um, the way you, you show that this sequence converges is not by playing the convergence game, but rather by showing that it's Cauchy. Okay. So you need to show that monotone and bounded real sequence implies that sequence is Cauchy. That's what you need to show. And so, you know, the, the proof part, the proof logic part, will definitely start out, let D, a positive real number, be given. And then it'll proceed and find a capital N, and then you'll have to show that if little m and little n are indices past there, that implies that the z sub n minus the z sub m are less than d. This will be the proof logic part. There will obviously be some calculations that are required in order to show what the capital N is and that it will satisfy. And so um, this is what you need to read about. And it's proved in her book, you know. Basically, you just march backwards from, okay, let me go really quickly. So let's, um, monotone could mean two things. It could mean um, increasing or it could mean decreasing. And so technically there's two proofs, but just let's, let's say we're, we're monotone increasing. So the, X, the Xn's are getting bigger. 
so the next one is always bigger than the previous. Okay. <clears throat> then, on, you know, in a picture, you have somewhere as x1, x2 has to be to the right, x3 has to be either on top of it or to the right, x4 has to be to the right. So they're marching to the right. Okay. But we said it's bounded. We're assuming it's monotone, so that they're marching to the right. We're assuming it's bounded, so there is a bound. Let's call it capital U. This is in the real numbers. Then the idea is, remember, your proof starts, let D be given. OK, so let D be given. Now we need to find capital N. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to march backwards by D. Right? The sequence is marching to the right, and we're going to march left by D. And eventually, we will find out that there is some x sub capital N that's past one of these, but that the next one, the next uh, marching that we did, was still an upper bound. Still an upper bound. But that means that everything is inside a um, is within D of each other. Okay, so you, you march back, so U is an upper bound, then this point right here is U minus D. Either that's an upper bound again, or there's some x capital N that's there. And so um, then we might have to march back to u minus 2d. And either that's an upper bound, or there's some x capital N that, that's past it. And so you see that if we keep marching back, eventually at some u minus kd for k a natural number, you know, how many steps do we take left? Um, some u minus kd is an upper bound. So that all, you know, the x sub n are less than or equal to u minus kd, the x sub m are less than or equal to u minus kd for all m and n. And, and yet u minus one more step is not an upper bound. That means that there, there exists a capital N such that x sub capital N is between, is between um, u minus k plus 1d and u minus kd. And guess what? This has length d, and so that's basically a proof. Um, that's it for this section, so you can read it in the book. One more thing. You really need to know this proof. So just quiz yourself on it. It's not too bad. It's very famous. It's, um... By the way, do you know why an odd number squared is odd? If you have an odd number, it looks like that. For some integer, it, you know, all odd numbers look something like this. Now, if you square it, what do they get? And guess what? This part looks like two times something plus one, which means it is odd. So that's how we know that an odd, an odd number squared is odd. If you take an even number, it looks like 2k for some integer k or natural number k or integer k. Um, and if you square it, you get 4k squared, which is equal to 2 times some integer. And so that's why an even number squared is, again, even.